gentlemen of the jury. We have presented copious, clear evidence that Eleanor Carlyle, who stands before you, is a vicious, multiple murderess, and one who shows not the slightest feeling of remorse. No remorse. That's right. I feel nothing. Why should I? When you have wanted someone dead, longed for it, planned it, and watched till you see the last flicker of life in the eyes. We ask you now to contemplate the full horror of a second cold-blooded murder, wickedly planned and executed on a hot afternoon at Hunterbury. The deadly salmon paste, so thickly spread. He's trying to see just exactly why I did it. What I felt. All of it seems so inevitable now. As if it began years and years ago, and yet it was only last summer. The beginning. The beginning it seemed happy. The roses are all right. They're lovely. Good. I try to be a respectable fiance. And you are. Soon, even these extended lunch hours will be respectable. So, if I go to France for two weeks, you can meet me in a 2K. I'm a mile over there by then, all very respectable, and we'll be back for the Astor's Autumn Ball. How about it? Eleanor? Oh, it sounds perfect. There's something else on your mind today, isn't there? Oh, Roddy, you know me so well. Yes. Something arrived this morning. It's stupid, but I can't get it out of my mind. I'm intrigued. Is it a bill? After all, it's the height of summer when the fairies dance and all the nasty bills come tripping along. <laughs> no. But I want to show it to you. warn you. Someone's sucking up to your aunt in Hunterbury, so you and your fiancé get cut out of the will. The person may seem white as snow, but wants to cheat you both, and the old lady, the old lady will die of another stroke any day. God. It can't be true. It's just someone out to cause trouble. Yes. I'm sure you're right. It was quite a shock, though. We haven't been down there this month. So we should go. Because of this? No. Not, not just this. You care for her. So do I. But the house matters. And think of the summers we spent there as children. She always said she wanted one of us to have it, which means both of us now are engaged. So what in heaven's name is wrong with making sure? Oh, Roddy, I'd love to go down. Then it's settled. After all, I want to show it to Dr. Lord. Oh. You sure that's wise? Yes. If anyone knows who sent it, he would. But darling, it's so poisonous. Oh, well. If you must, I still say you should burn it. Sometimes when we're married, living here together, we'll send all the servants away and do just exactly what we oh, want. Oh, yes? And what about your meals? We'll eat with our fingers by the fire. Yes. We won't allow anyone to disturb us. Just, just you, you and me, me and, the and the wind, wind in, the in, the in the trees. Where's Mrs. Bishop? 
Okay, okay, somewhere. The hall is always so dark. <laughs> oh, oh. Good <laughs> lord. I never did get used to this lift. It's such a shame she doesn't use it now. No, she doesn't even come out of her room anymore. Miss Carlyle, Mr. Winter, I'm so sorry. The nurses are coping well, though. The last stroke did take your aunt so badly. And look, here's another great help. Just back from her studies in Germany. You must both remember Mary, of course, the gardener's daughter. Hello, Eleanor. Roddy. Hello, Mary. Well, it's been a while. Hello, Miss Carlyle. Mr. Winter, how good to see you. Well, she's not so bad today, but she may be asleep now. Would you like to go in? Yes, I think so. Will you excuse us, please? Thank you, Nurse Hopkins. Would you like some tea? Oh, no, thank you. I don't drink tea. Mr. Winter? Oh, yes, please. Aunt Laura. I thought you were sleeping. Oh, no. Lying here like a captive, as usual. Come away, death, and in sad Cyprus let me be laid. Morbid as ever. <laughs> it gets me through. Roddy, how lovely. <laughs> you know, I am so... Pleased you are engaged. And I know your <laughs> parents would have been too. About time, I thought. It's wonderful to see you, Aunt Laura. You look, you look fine. No, I don't. Now, Roddy, I'm quite sure you need some refreshment. And I want to have a little talk with your bride-to-be. Fine. I'll look in on you later. Now, don't go putting her off me, or I'll make a point of moving in here and wailing from your battlements. <laughs> did you see Mary? Yes. I was astonished. When did she get back? Oh, a few weeks ago. I'm sure I told you. Isn't she beautiful? I am so glad she has come back from Germany, mm. Elena. She has been very good to me. And I'm so pleased you and Roddy are together. You do care for him? Of course I do. Enough and not too much. What? Oh, it's just something we used to say. How oh, you should never care too much for a man. Aunt Laura, tell me something, honestly. Do you think love is ever a happy thing? Oh, Eleanor. Perhaps it always brings more sorrow than joy. But who could do without it? Anyone who has never really loved, hasn't lived. <laughs> Miss Carlyle is still in with her now. Miss Carlyle, the niece? Is that right? <laughs> never was that sure about her, to be honest. No? Try too hard. Well, they're calling them kissing cousins in the tattler, but she's lucky to have caught them, and she knows it. Behind the eyes, she's nervous as a kitten. I remember I was dripping with sweat. I could hardly hold on. But you did. You got right to the top, didn't you? I think you must have lost your grip. <laughs> I couldn't help it. My hands were slipping with the perspiration. And then you fell at my feet laughing. <laughs> oh, oh, hello, Eleanor. We were just remembering the old times. Of course. We'll have lots to talk about. There's tea in the dining room. <laughs> now look here, Doctor. I've said this before. In any civilized country, I just say I wanted to end it all, and you would finish me off with some nice painless drug. Well, I'm not sure I wish to be hanged just yet. 
But now you're doing so well. Leave me all your money. I might reconsider if you like. <laughs> More humbug. And who were you looking at? Um, your niece. Eleanor. Oh, that reminds me. She wants to see you before you go. So, what do you think of her, eh? She's, um, she's, she's very impressive. Yes, very impressive. Yes, she is. You know, you ought to get married, Doctor. I'm sorry. I just couldn't think of anyone else to take into our confidence. No, 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 no. I'm flattered. Well, you're right. This is a horrible thing. I suppose it must be someone in the village. But who could the letter be referring to? Who has access to our aunt other than the nurses? Well, Ted Holick, the gardener, is up there. He helps carry the oxygen. Mrs. Bishop goes in, the vicar, myself. Mary Gerald is there a lot, of course. Nurse O'Brien lives in, and now, of course, Nurse Hopkins comes in every day, too. I suppose Mary is the newest here. Well, could somebody be jealous of her? Does she have a suitor? I don't think so. Though Ted Holick always did have a soft spot for her. It's probably nothing to do with her. Oh, I'm sorry. Somehow a thing like this just plays on your nerves. Just the idea of someone spying and trying to cause bad feeling. Yes, it's probably best forgotten. You have been kind, but it's idiotic of me to ask you to play detective. Shall we just burn it? No, no, no. Nobody need play detective. I know a real one. His name is Poirot. He's staying here a few days preparing evidence for a trial in Manby. He's horribly bored. And I'm sure would leap at the chance of some diversion. He has some peculiarities, like his endless herbal teas. He's charming, but very, very discreet. Mon ami, the doctor who bears a message is always a sight most worrying. I hope you've not heard from one of my physicians. Of course not, Paul. How are you? You settling in all right now? Is it any more comfortable? Well, for some, maybe. As for me, I have my work, of course, but... What pleasure is there for me in the evidence of a case I saw one year since? No. I am, as you say, bored to the tears. Well, perhaps I can help you see a lady whom I admire a good deal has come to me with a problem. An anonymous letter. Ah. Huh? You mean there may be a little exercise at last? Well, don't get too excited. I'm sure it's uh, trivial. <laughs> ah, now there's Ted Hornick with Mary Gerard. She is a great favorite at Hunsbury House. You see, this letter is about that household. It's a grand film. It's garbled. It's all set in Paris. I'm sorry, Ted. I've already said no. You set your eyes on someone else, is that it? No, of course not. Bon? No, I'm sorry. Enter, if you please. Thank you. The writer of this has been very careful. That interests you? Are we? Look at the pressure on the page. Now regard the words. There is malice here. What is just as concerning, the pretense of malice. And I do not believe for one moment that the writer of this letter wishes to protect the interests of Eleanor Carlyle. Unless, of course, Eleanor Carlyle wrote this herself. That's a strange suggestion, Poirot. I could see how upset you were. It's not strange to you, perhaps, mon ami, but once I found your strategy with your pawns most strange, and then you very nearly put me in check. That was a long time ago. <laughs> To say the truth, when you came here, I thought this letter would be a thing just trivial. And yet, the care of its construction, something of the words and of the design, tells to me that is not the case. Of course, as you say, it may lead to nothing. So why, eh? Why do I sense the outlook may be dark? Miss Carlyle? Mrs. Bishop? Have you seen Mr. Winter? No, but I don't think he's upstairs. The garden, maybe? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Ah, he's nice enough, Mary, dear. I'm sure you can do better. Yes, with your education especially. Now, do let us see what your aunt sent. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I was looking for Mr. Winter. 
Oh, I haven't seen him, have you, Mary? No, I've just come back from the post office. This is from my Aunt Mary in New Zealand, my mother's sister. I was named after her, so she always sends me things. That is kind. Yes. She emigrated before I was born, and now she's the only family I have left. <gasps> what a lovely thing. Oh. Yes, it is. I I'm sorry to interrupt you. You should show it to Mrs. Wellman. You know, she's been so kind to me. Only today she was saying that she might help me in the future, just like she did with my schooling. Well, I suppose I'll look in on Aunt Laura before I go to bed. Of course. I'll sit here a little. And I could always come and tuck you in. Perhaps not tonight. Mrs. Bishop may be doing her rounds. Mm. There's time enough. All right. I'll let you rest tonight. So, how did you like meeting Mary again? What? Oh, yes. She's, she's a sweet girl. Night, night. Mr. Winter. Mr. Winter. How do you do? You are so great that you've come. Oh, please, not at all. It is most kind of you to invite me. We are honored. The Cartwright trial is causing great excitement. Indeed. For me, alas, it is like eating the same meal three times a day. <laughs> Excuse me. Of course. Monsieur Poirot, this is Mary Gerard, whose late father looked after the garden here. She's just returned from Europe. Mademoiselle Gerard? I'm very glad to meet you, Monsieur Poirot. Hey, madam? Oh. I'll take the salmon, thank you. Uh, Mademoiselle Gerard, may I ask where in Europe? Germany. I was staying with a family near Freiburg. Oh, the Black Forest. It's a beautiful country. Do you know, I think the National Socialists are doing quite a fair job over there. I sometimes wish we had politicians like that here. I think, monsieur, that you are most fortunate that you do not. Do you? Oh, well, it's much too pleasant an occasion for European politics. Roddy, Excuse me. Word. Mademoiselle. So, Monsieur Poirot, do you think my letter is important? I cannot yet give you an answer, Mademoiselle Carlyle, but naturally I take everything to be important until it proves otherwise. Even the strategies at chess of my friend, Dr. Lord. Has he ever win? No. But one time he came quite close. No, no, no. He has a mind truly wonderful for the game. <laughs> that is my aunt, Monsieur Poirot. She's too ill to join us, I'm afraid. I realize it is much too soon to say who may have written the letter. But I know Dr. Lord has told you about our household. So, do you have any suspicions about who it refers to? This interloper? There is no need for me to suspect, mademoiselle. The writer has made it quite obvious. How? Hello, the phrase, white as snow, it is most odd, yes? But certainly it is used deliberately. So tell to me, mademoiselle, who was it that had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow? Mary. Right. <laughs> Mrs. Wellman, are you all right? Oh, dear. You're not yourself. Now, don't you get agitated. 
You've had another turn. I'll call doctor. Please, Lewis. I, I need to see the photograph of Lewis. This again. <sighs> Please, I can't open your private things. I must get the doctor. This is well when you're ill. I must send for the doctor now. I must. It's all right, it's all right, keep calm. Don't excite yourself. You want somebody to calm? Your lawyer, you want your lawyer to come? You want to change something in your will, Aunt Laura, related to Mary, Mary Gerard. I'll call the lawyers and Seddon should be here directly. Please don't worry yourself about it. That's right. Rest now. Rest now. It will be done. May I go in? Oh, yes, of course. The doctor is there. I see. Yes. Well, thank you. I'll meet him here tomorrow. Goodbye. Seddon can't be here until tomorrow. Is that all right? Yes, I think so. She's, uh, she's had another stroke, but uh, I'm sure she has a little time yet. I've seen some improvement since last night. Have you lost something, dear? It's that sarcoma in the village, Eliza Ryken. I was sure I put her tube of morphine in here for tomorrow, but somehow it's gone. Oh, the only place I've put my bag down was out there in the corridor. Oh, why don't you look again, dear? Nobody here will take it. No, it's gone. Oh, your work is done. I thought you'd be singing for her. Oh, I am content to return to London when I meet her. I do not like the unfinished business. Oh, the letter. Wait. Well, perhaps he wanted it to be more than it was. I promise you. They have other things to think about now. Yes? Ordinary things. Ah. Even so, I return this letter with reluctance, and only because it is not my property. Ask them to keep it safe, if you please, and keep me informed of any developments. Well, I'm sure there'll be none. Of course. There's no sense in hanging on to it. Even your detective failed to get anywhere. But Roddy, he asked us to keep it safe. Well, no doubt to cover his own failure. He's gone now. We have more important things to think about. Thank God the doctor said she may come out of this. She should be too gloomy. She wouldn't want that. No. It's just seeing her like this. I'm so tired, Roddy. I think I'm going to go to bed early. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll let you sleep. You look all in. I'll just play some billiards or something before I go up. Eleanor, Nurse Hopkins is happy to stay tonight and take over from Nurse O'Brien, but she would like a word. Oh, thank you, Mary. Are you off home now, or...? Well, I'd really like to stay. Of course. If you want to stay close by, you can use the room at the end. My aunt would like that. Thank you. Good night.
people, but I don't. I don't know. I'm coming. I'm very sorry. Would it have been painful? No, no, absolutely not. Sometimes you have a sudden relapse like that. It's very quick. And in its way, it's a mercy. You must take all the consolation you can from that. Godfrey, I say. I couldn't have borne seeing her lingering on in the state she was in tonight. You saw her tonight? What? Oh, yes. I, um, I left the cards and looked in briefly while the nurse was getting tea. Um, she was lying there, breathing so hard. I hated seeing her like that. It's probably why I felt so strange all evening. I... I know I wasn't really myself. No? You should go to bed. I won't come in and disturb you. Not, not tonight. Good night, Roddy. I'll have a time to you, please. Sorry, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Ladies, girls. The British class. Library, if you please. Thank you. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Amen. You came back just because of this, Miss yes, Hatton. It was quite sudden, but I was probably unduly optimistic in my diagnosis. Sometimes they change quickly. She had another stroke that affected her very badly. So you see the letter, it was correct. It said that she would die after another stroke. Well, yes, that's true, but given the severity of the first stroke, it's hardly remarkable. Poirot, I think you may be overreacting. There was no murder. Please, to be honest with me. In your profession as a doctor, this is your true opinion. Yes, it is. And I have to ask you to honor it as a friend. So you give to me no choice? I don't want to see people upset. When will you go back? I'm not going back. I intend to stay a little. And perhaps we can play some chess. Well, now, we're nearly all done here. But what a terrible shame they didn't offer the village a cup of tea. It's just not the same without us. Maybe, but Miss Carlyle didn't look good at all. I doubt she had the strength. Mm. Strength enough to hear the will, though, you notice. The lawyer is down there with her now, and Mrs. Wellman would have made sure there was refreshment after a funeral. You mark my words. Oh, I meant to ask you, dear. Did you find that tube of morphine all right when you went home? No. 
I did not. I don't understand it. But there were some papers and things I threw out, so it may have been there. Yes, that must have been it. I wouldn't worry about it anymore if I were you, dear. Well, time to say goodbye. Again, I'm very sorry for what happened, Miss Carlyle, Mr. Winter. And I count it a great pity she didn't summon me earlier. Mr. Seddon, it's perfectly obvious she wanted to alter her will. I mean, that's clear to everyone. She mentioned Mary, and she wanted to change it. Miss Carlyle, I can assure you of one thing. You are wrong in that assumption. There could be no change as such. You see, your aunt made no will. What? But that's extraordinary. Not, I fear, as extraordinary as you might think, Mr. Winter. Uh, people are often superstitious. They think if they make a will, it means they'll die, so they put it off. Didn't you reason with her? Frequently, and she said all the usual things that she didn't intend to die just yet. It's just human nature, I'm afraid. People will go on avoiding a thing in their personal life which is distasteful to them. So, the upshot is very simple. Since your aunt died with no bequests, no will, no settlements or trusts, everything, including this house, goes to her next of kin, which of course is you, her niece, Eleanor Carlyle. Everything? Well, apart from death duties, the estate will still be substantial. No, Eleanor, you should have it all. I don't want you to think otherwise. It's your right. But, Roddy... We said it didn't matter who was left the money since we were to be married, do you remember? Yes. But are we? Well, I thought that was the idea. Of course, if you've got other plans now... I... Roddy, can't you be honest? I don't... Sorry, I don't know what's happened to me. I do. It's Mary, isn't it? I saw you. God, I... Something, something happened when I first arrived here, when we were in the garden. I don't know what. Isn't it obvious? Every time you look at her, I see it in your face. I didn't want to feel like this. I was quite happy. I was upset. All decent, reasonable things. Love isn't reasonable. <laughs> You'd better take this back, Roddy. in France. Clear your head. If you still feel the same after your back, then that's the time to pursue it. I didn't deserve you. Even as a friend. Sometimes it's all like a dream. As if I may wake up and find she wasn't there. But she is there. What are your plans now? Do you intend to go away? Not directly. I still have to clear out my parents' things from the lodge house. That'll take me a few days. I've been putting it off ever since I got back. As you know, Mary, my aunt always took a great interest in you. Yes, she was very kind. You will be aware that she made no will. I have thought about that last day a good deal. And it seems to me that... If she had lived, she would have wanted to make several legacies. Of course, I've made provision for the servants, but you don't quite come into that class. I'm sure she would have wanted to make some contribution for your future. Therefore, I am arranging, as soon as probate is granted, to advance you £7,000. That sum to be yours, to do with 
absolutely as you please. Thank you. It was quite a surprise that she left no will. But then, many people don't. Yes, I only made one myself this year. A will? Oh, Nurse O'Brien thinks everyone should. I have my aunt in New Zealand, so I named her. You've been so kind. It was my aunt's wish. Well, that's all, I think. Thank you. Hello. You're in a hurry? Oh, well, I've just heard some good news and I'm on my way to meet someone. I'm very pleased for you, mademoiselle. Uh, mademoiselle, is it your intention to remain in the village? Oh, I'm staying here for now. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Oh, pardon, I will not detain you further. Mademoiselle, please be careful as you go. Of course. It's a great piece of luck for you, Mary. It was good of Miss Carlyle to do the right thing. She didn't... Well, she didn't look very pleased about it. Hardly surprising after what happened with you and Mr. Winter now, is it, dear? Nurse, that's hardly our business. Oh, sorry, dear, but the whole village must be talking about us. I didn't lead him on. Ah, but has he made you an offer? The truth is, he's indicated. Oh, well, there you are now. Isn't that romantic? Oh. Excuse me. I do hope it's all right. You wonder if it won't hurt her in the end. I know. And that family at the house has not always been lucky in love. Was there, Carlyle? You permit that I join you? Oh, yes, of course. I wish to speak to you of your anonymous letter. I do not yet know who wrote it. Oh, the letter? Oui. Oh, so much has happened. I've quite forgotten. I'm afraid, Monsieur Poirot, the letter is destroyed. It doesn't matter who sent it now. We'll never know anyway. Oh, was there, Carlyle? It is no matter if the letter is destroyed. It is in here. And I said I did not yet know. I did not say never. So please, to extend to me the courtesy of having some confidence in my skills. Oh, I'm sorry, Monsieur Poirot. The truth is, I'm a little distracted. I'm sure you've heard that my engagement is ended. I'm sure the whole village is talking about it. Oh, yes, of course. I was very sorry to hear it. If you permit, mademoiselle, I extend to you my utmost sympathy. I can understand the ache of the heart. It is a place very lonely. Thank you. It is certainly hard when the accident of another person's return, of another person's beauty, suddenly destroys your life. Then a man who is swayed by such things is he's not likely to be constant. Is that not so? Well, that is not so. It's only her. Nobody else could have changed him. Nobody. Mary's destroyed everything. And I can't help it, Monsieur Parra, but I just wish... I wish so much that she was dead. See, it troubles you also, my dear doctor. To the glass it is poured, it is perfect in every way, and yet I choose not to drink. I wait, and this troubles you. What are you thinking? About action that is uncompleted. Action that is suspended. Like this. 
Pouring without drinking? And yet surely once it is poured, it will be drunk, eh? But no. <sighs> and it is the same here. For crime, it can be like this also. You question me for staying here. But sometimes, as in the case of your letter, I see a pattern, I... I see a color. I sense in my heart the inevitability. And yet what can I, Poirot, do? Nothing. For the glass sits on the table, waiting. Waiting for someone to drink. Me? The cook and the maids have taken a week, as you asked them, but I don't require time off. And you shouldn't be alone in the house. It's not right. Mrs. Bishop, I just want to go quietly through my aunt's things. I don't need anyone, you see. I'm almost certainly going to sell. The other servants wondered if that would be the case. Naturally, we had hoped. Yes, I had hoped too. Miss Carlyle, what can I do for you? I wanted some sandwich paste, Mr. Turner. Of course. Now, what would you like? Uh, salmon, crab and shrimp, ham and tongue? Well, in spite of the names, I always think they taste rather alike. Well, in a way, but of course they're tasty. Very tasty. I wanted salmon. Oh, and crab and shrimp. People used to be rather afraid of eating fish paste, didn't they? There have been cases of ptomaine poisoning. I can assure you, Miss Carlyle, this is an excellent brand. I've never had a single complaint. Oh, of course. Oh, I didn't mean anything. Thank you. in the village. Is he back again so soon? What? No, Roddy's not here. He's still abroad. Well, it certainly looked like him. Maybe I'm wrong. Yes. There seem to be rather a lot of flies around. The salmon is for you, Mary. It's nearest. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. The others are crab and shrimp. Thank you. I meant to get some coffee, but I, I quite forgot in the end. 
Well, if there's tea, I can make some. Oh, yes. Not for me, but please. Polly put the kettle on. Remember, we used to sing that when we were children. Yes, I do. It is a pity, isn't it? You can never go back. Nice and strong. There you are, Mary. Thank you. This was very thoughtful of you, Miss Carlyle. It's a nuisance to have to break off and go into the village for lunch. Mm. Are you all right, Mary? It's just the sandwich was rather bitter. I hope the paste was all right. Oh, mine was all right. We have some more tea. Are you sure you won't have a cup, Miss Carlyle? No, thank you. Then I'll just go and turn off the kettle. I left it on in case we wanted to fill the pot up again. Mary. Yes? Nothing. Oh, I thought I saw a man outside. Is there someone here? No, only Ted. He wasn't in. Oh, it's quite hot in here. Yes, it faces south. Well, I tidied up the other plates. Let me find the keys. Thank you. Did you prick yourself? Oh, no, um... Oh, it was the rose trellis. It's quite a jungle. I may have to ask Ted to help us. Are you all right, Miss Carlyle? You're not looking quite the thing. Oh, well, I... I just want to get all this clearing done. Well, I'll be up when I'm finished down here. So it's Nellie and Mrs. Markinson for these. And that poor creature at Ivy Cottage, who's not quite all there, could have some of the night things. This will be a godsend to them. I think I'll take them there myself while Mary gets on at the lodge. She's gone back there, has she? Mary? No, I left her in the library. Well, that was ages ago. What's she been doing? Mary? Mary? Why, she's fallen asleep. <laughs> Come on, my girl. Wake up. Mary? 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 I'll have to call Dr. Lord this moment. What's the matter? The matter? This girl is near death. I think she's been poisoned. charged with murder, yes. There's something I have to tell you. This way? Ah, Poirot! Have a look at this. We found it yesterday, just here where those sandwiches were made. We can't find any more, but it has been identified as part of the label for morphine. 
They shared the tea, so must be the sandwiches. Are you aware that the file of morphine disappeared from this house? What? Dr. Lord here just told me of it. It was in the bag of the nurse. I'm sure the nurses will confirm it. So, Miss Carlyle had an ample opportunity to take it and use it. And her motive is clear. She was distraught that her fiancé had abandoned her for the deceased. Of course, there are some difficulties like the fact they all ate the sandwiches. It is scarcely a difficulty if you read the statements. Yes, they all ate the sandwiches, but the poison, it only needed to be in one. And the favorite of Mary Gerard, as Eleanor Carlyle herself testifies, it was the salmon. Then that's how it was done. Then there's your anonymous letter. That doesn't really fit. Why not? Let us suppose that Eleanor Carlyle was most anxious about the return of Mary Gerard, for there is much talk of her beauty. And she knows that her fiancé and Mary were close in the past and that they were bound to meet together here. So Eleanor Carlyle herself writes the anonymous letter, hoping to turn him against Mary. She wishes him to think that she is a girl out for what she can get. But it does not work. She loses him. And so she is driven to a crime far more desperate. Well, how could she hope to get away with it? My dear doctor, I am describing a crime of passion. Horror. Poor, how could you do that? How could you build a case against Elena Carlyle? She's not a murderer. How can you be so subtle? You saw her qualities. Wait, and I also saw her pain. She is not capable of it. On the contrary, she is more than capable. That man in there has no idea of the woman. My dear doctor, do you suppose I was advancing the case to help him? Given the facts that I see here, any prosecuting counsel, any idiot of a magistrate will come to the conclusions that I have just advanced like that. And I think that it is fair to say that you are partial. I don't deny it. But she didn't do this, please. I'm begging you, help me find the truth. My dear doctor, you ask for my help, but I do not think you have been completely honest with me. I still have my suspicions about the death of Laura Wellman, and I'm going to ask the police to exhume her body. And so I ask you again, to tell me truthfully, what will they find? I don't know. But possibly morphine. Mon Dieu, I do not understand you. You told to me otherwise. You made me hold back as a friend, you said. Good God, Pearl, please. I never dreamt of such a thing. I thought that it was probably natural. But there was another possibility. I was aware that she might have taken the drug herself. You see, she'd often talked of it. Oh, I comprehend. You are playing a merciful doctor. Huh? As I say, she talked of it. Under such circumstances, I didn't wish to cause a scandal by insisting on an autopsy. Oh, therefore, I must insist that you are now completely honest with me. You did not give her the drug at her request. I swear to you, I didn't. Hmm? I told her myself, I have no wish to be hanged. I wouldn't do it. Very well. Well, the same. I wish you had told me you had the suspicions. Because if you are right, it will be worse now for Eleanor Carlyle than even I could have thought. So, you do not wish to talk? I made a statement. I have nothing else to say. Mademoiselle Carlyle, you are aware of how your silence, it will be construed? It is no matter. such a shock, I can tell you. Now, we'll have some tea. Merci. Like I told the police, Monsieur Poirot, Miss Carlyle was so strange, very strange in her manner. I'd thought it for days, but that afternoon she was downright odd, talking as if she didn't know what she was saying, and her eyes so bright and queer. And you said that... But she looked guilty? Oh, yes, she was trembling before and afterwards. It was as if she'd been caught out. And those sandwiches that she made, did they look the same? Well, they were not on different bread? No, definitely not. White bread looked very much the same. But Mary had the salmon and we had the crab. 
And when I think of how poor Mary was when we found her... She was one of the most beautiful girls I ever saw, Mr. Poirot. And not stuck up as she could have been. The old lady had taken a tremendous fancy to her. Surprising, perhaps. Oh, that depends. Might be quite natural in one way. And surely it does an elderly person good to have a young face about. I see. And there's nothing else, huh? Nothing else at all that you can tell to me about Mary Gerard? I don't know of anything. No, Mary was not poisoned before she came here. How could she have walked from the lodge? No. Without doubt, Mary was poisoned in this room. Both she and Nurse Hopkins shared the tea, so... It must have been the sandwiches. But Poirot, somebody could easily have entered in here and tampered with them. Mm. There was a figure in the garden out there, but perhaps it was somebody from Mary's past. Or what is more likely, there's someone we know. I made a statement to the police, Mr. Poirot. I wasn't around this side of the house at all that day. I was up near the road. Did you see a figure? No. I, I did see a car. Some parked on the road early in the afternoon. And did you recognize the car? No, I don't think so. I think it was green. I just can't believe anyone would do such a thing. And certainly not Miss Carlyle. Tell me, Monsieur Horick, you were fond of Mary, were you not? Everyone knows that. It wasn't the same when, you, when, when she came back from abroad. But did she have any enemies? Not that I know. She was always a bit different, but... People liked her. Then, then after she came back, nobody knew her so well. And why is that? She was just changed. Not stuck up exactly, just, uh... Not one of us anymore. She is in her grave and all the difference to me. Wordsworth, I read him much. This poem expresses perhaps what you feel. Yes. I suppose it's widely known what I feel. I have to bring it up. Oh, pardon, please, to forgive me, Monsieur Winter. There are certain things one should not say, but nevertheless a detective, he is forced to say or to ask about the feelings of people. Oh. Well, if it helps Eleanor Poirot, ask all you want. Yes. You returned home early from France, I believe. Uh, you were seen here on the day of the murder. Yes, all right. I did come back. I didn't want Eleanor to know. You see, I decided to ask Mary to marry me. And you saw her? No. No, I didn't. You see, she wasn't expecting me, so I decided to wait. I certainly wasn't going to barge into Hunterbury. I waited here, close to Mary's lodgings. And of course, Mary, she never came. I saw an ambulance, police cars. People were talking. I overheard what they said. I couldn't face anyone, so I, I took a train back into town and waited for news. And I learned she was dead. I felt like... And you do not think Eleanor did this? No, of course not. The fact that they dragged Eleanor into this makes it even more tragic. 
So if she escapes the gallows, you will reconsider your engagement? What do you think I am? Of course not. It has ended. But I want her to be all right. She's a very decent person. Better than... Than you? Is that what you were going to say? No doubt at all, Pardo. Several ounces of morphine were found in her body. It was administered on the day she died. You're very kind, Mr. Poirot. I am happy to answer your questions. Of course, I heard about Mrs. Wellman. What a terrible thing, too. And you had no suspicions at that time? Not the least in the world. So tell it to me, if you please. Did anyone else enter the room of Madame Wellman that night, other than Mademoiselle Carlyle? I never left her side, except when Miss Carlyle came in. Oh, she was so bold and clever, that one. So why would she have wanted to do it? Hmm? For the money. That's why. She knew quite well if she didn't do it, every penny would go to Mary Gerard, and that's the truth. So Mary Gerard was a girl who was scheming and clever? No. Oh, that's a terrible thing to say. Mrs. Wellman adored her. She was a very sweet girl. But not one of us. Pardon. She was an only child. Is it possible, perhaps, that she could have been adopted? What? No. Certainly not. I must say, this is a lovely cake. Hmm. She made a will, is that correct? Awful. Awful to think of it now. Nurse Hopkins and I advised her it was a good thing to do. We thought she should, since she had expectations. I wish we'd never mentioned it now, I do. So the £7,000 goes to her arm. She has no other family here? Just her mother's sister is nursing out in New Zealand. I've written to the old lady, and what a terrible shock it will be, too. So will Miss Carlyle be hanged? If she is found guilty. Mrs. Wellman, whose money went to Eleanor Carlyle, was murdered by morphine. Mary Gerard, who came between Eleanor Carlyle and her fiancé, was murdered by morphine. And nobody in the world had the slightest motive to commit these murders other than the accused. No one had the slightest opportunity other than the accused. And this vengeful woman who openly wished her victim dead to more than one witness, never expressed the slightest remorse. Gentlemen of the jury, what is your verdict? Guilty. Eleanor Carlyle, you are sentenced to be taken hence to the prison in which you were last confined and from there to a place of execution where you will be hanged from the neck until dead. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Mademoiselle, please be careful as you go. Of course. Of course.
I will admit I have not been sleeping very well. But last night finally I sleep. And I dream. I dream. I dream of the victim. As she was at first, on the street outside of my hotel. A girl so lovely, the favorite of Madame Wellman, a girl who is liked by everyone, and yet she is still a mystery. And then, then I wake up, and I recall something. What? Um, it is a detail. In fact, it is half a detail, one twentieth of a detail, but yes, my friend, it worries me. Something that the nurse Hopkins said concerning Mary. What about her? Yes, what about her? What is behind her? You're not making sense. And suddenly I see that there is something that the good nurse Hopkins, she does not wish me to know, that she thinks has no bearing on the crime, but I believe that it may. Well, surely she would realize that. No, my dear doctor, nurse Hopkins is a woman of high intelligence within her limitations, but her intellect is hardly equal to that of mine. She might not see it, but her Poirot, he would. And suddenly there raises in my mind so many questions. No, I was right before. Something here is crooked. Time is short. There is something I need from you. Uh, it is a book. Um, how does he call itself? A book which describes the various medicines you prescribe. A formulary? Which says so. I must borrow it. Merci. When I visited you before, I said it was surprising how Madame Wellman favored Mary Gerard. You said it was only natural. And I thought you were merely talking about the friendship, that it was natural. And then I think again of Mary, and I hear that word again, natural. And I see that you used it deliberately. Oh, I know it. And now you must tell to me why. Nurse O'Brien and I had both heard the old lady crying out about something in her past. There was a man called Lewis. But we both knew there was much more to it than that. And then I found this in the lodge after Mary had died. These men are women, huh? And the baby? It's Mary Gerard. So Mary was the illegitimate daughter of Mother Merman. It's a sad story, as you'll see from the letter. The man couldn't marry her. He had his own family. Sometime later, he was killed on the Western Front. The Gerrards had no children. Mrs. Wellman went to Scotland and took Mrs. Gerrard with her, where the baby was born. Naturally, she paid for Mary's schooling and told them she would provide for her. But she couldn't admit the truth. She had to avoid the scandal. But at last, Mary becomes clearer. But what sadness. So, dear Mary, for all these years I've had to keep this secret from the girl I brought up and such a hardship that that is me. Of course, we had suspected as much. Nurse intimated she knew, but what's the point of it coming out now? I was going to destroy these. As I said before, Mr. Poirot, let the dead rest in peace. No. Not when one has to consider the living. 
That was her color. You would say nothing before. But now I know a little more. And I want to help you. I believe I can. But you must answer some questions about that day. I beg of you. Why? Is there any purpose? purpose? Oh, yes, of course. There's a purpose. Please. Now, just tell it to me from the very beginning. Firstly, why did you give time off to the servants? I was upset. I wanted to be alone. And when you made the sandwiches, did you see anyone outside? No. All right, then you went to sort through some things of your aunt. Did you discover anything that affected you or any private matters concerning your aunt? What? No. All right, then you took Mary and Nurse Hopkins into the library where you gave to them the sandwiches. What was Mary doing when you left her? She was on the sofa. She seemed normal. No. Each detail, if you please. I went down to the pantry. Right. Nurse was there doing the washing up. Mm -hmm. She said she'd seen a man in the garden. I didn't see anything. So what then did you talk of? I don't know. Oh yes, the rose trellis by the lodge. She had a mark on her arm where the thorn had scratched her. And then it all came back to me, all of it. How when we were children, Roddy and I kept having this quarrel about the War of the Roses. He liked the white rose. I said they weren't real because they didn't even smell. I preferred red because they were big and dark and smelled like summer. And I realized something, yes, I did. There was no reason to kill Mary. Because Rody would never have stayed with me. When I went back. When you went back, Mary was dying. You might as well ask me then, did I intend to kill Mary Jared? No. No, mademoiselle. Now, please, do forgive me. I have very little time. You have told to me all that I need. And there are some things I still do not wish to know. Please. I'm sorry, Mr. Poirot. There is something I need to say in private. Mr. Hulick, you see before you a miserable animal who has been a triple imbecile. I am 36 times an idiot. Sir. Forgive me, but I have discovered something in a way that is most painful. Hideously painful, but very important. Oh, pardon. So, Sophie, no matter. Please, do sit. And tell to me what you wish to say. It concerns Dr. Lord, sir. If you do not agree, I will go higher. I wish you to take this matter with the utmost seriousness. I will do what I can, sir. It will have to be tomorrow. Very well. Oh, you realize we have less than a day and a night. Why did you ask me here? Because I wanted to show you this. The Zephyrin Rose. So, isn't that Mr. Winter? What is going on? What did Eleanor say? I will tell it to you. She told me of a quarrel a long time ago and how she and Monsieur Winter were on different sides. And it made it very clear to me, mon ami, how she fell in love a long time ago with a man who could not return her feelings. 
And so, Doctor, I began to see through all the lies that had been told to me. Who has lied to you? <laughs> Everyone. Particularly you. But at last the matter, it is almost concluded, for I have made a trap. Shall we go back to the house? I had the message from the inspector, Poirot, but can you tell me what this is all about? It strikes me as very unpleasant. I never wanted to see this room again. I'm not surprised. What does that mean? Gentlemen, please. I have concluded that nothing in this matter is what it seems. Firstly, we have heard that on the day of the murder, there was seen lurking in the garden a man who was very tall and who resembled you, Monsieur Winter. I told you, I never came here. So would you be surprised to learn of the will of Mademoiselle Carlyle? I established it last night, that it leaves everything to you. I swear, I had no idea. So perhaps you stood outside and observed her making the sandwiches and thought that they were for her. Alors, if she died, you would be a man very rich. This is outrageous. I told you, I never came into the grounds. However, if she was hanged, you would be equally rich. So, let us assume as did the trial, that the murder, it was successful. It is easy to imagine, you or another, being aware that Eleanor Carlyle intended to invite Mary Gerard here, and also to know that the preference of Mary was for the salmon paste. Now, both of these things, they were well known. Are you including me? I include everyone. Now, this person has the fire of morphine, and the chance it comes. And this is what he finds. The sandwiches. One of salmon paste, the other two of shrimp and crab. Hello. Our murderer approaches the sandwiches. And at once he observes that the color and the texture are identical. So which one is the salmon paste, huh? There's no way on earth he could distinguish by smell. So, what can this person do? I am afraid that there is only one thing he can do. He tastes. It was bad enough the first time. Then, suddenly, I realized how stupid I had been. I, Hercule Poirot, had followed my reasoning, yes, but I had failed to take into account the madness of the English palate. For, gentlemen, what do we find? We find that we are entering into the realms of lunacy. I do not care if our murderer had the palate of a master chef. He could never distinguish between these slurries. No, it is a fact. These sandwiches are all but indistinguishable. So, I come to the conclusion. I, Hercule Poirot, do not care what was said at the trial. This could never, ever be the practical method of murder. So Eleanor Carlyle did not poison the sandwich? No, she did not. Who did? Nobody. You say it was an accident? No, no, no. No, she was murdered. But not by these disgusting sandwiches. I said just now that everyone had lied to me, huh? Who, oh, for example, the man that Nurse Hopkins saw outside here. She was lying? No, no, no. Indeed, she was not. And you know that, Dr. Lord, because you are aware of who it was. It was you. Monsieur Hollick recognized your car, but did not want to say so in front of you. So last night he came to the hotel to tell it to me. So here is yet another liar. Huh? But why? Was it because you feared for Eleanor Carlyle? Was it your heart I could forgive? Or something much more sinister? All right, all right, all right. I wouldn't have done anything to protect her. I was just a fool to think I could deceive you. Wait, either a fool or something worse. Please to remain, I will return.
you believe in ghosts? No, of course not. I had a message to come here. Oui. As you know, someone entered this room on the last night that Madame Werman was alive and gave to her the morphine. You told to the court that you never left the sight of your patient during that evening except when Mademoiselle Carlyle was present. Well, she was the accused, so no person could challenge you. But it is a fact that Monsieur Winter entered this room when you were making the tea, and perhaps others. Well, maybe I was out a few times. That's no crime. But that is not your only lie. When I asked you if Mary Gerard was adopted, you denied it. Why did you not tell to me the truth? That? But it has no bearing. No bearing? You suppose the fact that Mary Gerard was the illegitimate daughter of Madame Wellman has no bearing on this? Eleanor Carlyle only inherited the money because she was the nearest next of kin to Madame Wellman. Now it emerges that she was not. At that point, Mary Gerard stood to inherit 200,000 pounds. Ah, so that's it. It was another motive for Miss Carlyle to do away with her. On the contrary, it was no motive at all. Such an action, it would have been pointless, since Mary Gerard had already made a will. Was it you who told her to do that? We talked about it. What are you saying, Mr. Poirot? That someone other than Eleanor Carlyle benefits from her death. This came to me yesterday. And then I began to think again about the anonymous letter. Designed to breed the distrust between Mary Gerard and Eleanor Carlyle, and suddenly the light it began to dawn. About, amongst other things, New Zealand. Excuse me. As you wanted me here, I thought I'd make us a cup of tea. Oh, thank you. You are most kind. And now perhaps you'll please tell me what this is about? As the truth is, Nurse Hopkins, I brought you here to talk to you about this rose. It is a rose on the trellis of the lodge. You were pricked, I believe, by its thorn? Yes. But as you can quite well regard, the Zafrain rose, it has no thorn. Well, then it was a nail from the trellis. I thought it was a thorn. And sharp enough, too. Your tea. Merci. Quite so. A mistake. Tell me. You have lived in New Zealand? How would you discover that? Mind you, it is known. Is it? The truth is, I have tried to discover it myself, but without any success. It little matters. But I did have a little more success in discovering your real name. Your first name is Mary, the same as Mary Gerard. And your surname is Riley, the same as her adopted mother. Poor Mary, she never guessed who you really were, did she? And that letter that you showed me... You never discovered it here at the lodge. No, it was a letter you received. You know, at the time I thought that the wording was rather strange. And so, dear Mary, I have had to keep this secret from the girl I brought up. So why would the writer address her daughter directly as Mary and then proceed to talk about her in the third person? 
Because it was not a mother writing to her daughter at all. No. It was a mother writing to her sister, confessing the secret of the true parentage of her adopted daughter. Oh, yes, it was your letter sent to you, her aunt in New Zealand. And this planted a temptation which grew. What temptation? The temptation of a big inheritance, and it was for that reason that you came here. You tried to stir up feelings against Mary with your poison pen, the anonymous letter. You killed Madame Wellman, knowing that she had made no will. You even tricked poor Mary into making a will in favor of her kind aunt in New Zealand, encouraged by the postcards and presents which you arranged. Oh, yes, she was named after you. And yet you killed her. Later you would have released that sad letter, ensuring that the settlement would change. And from a safe distance, <laughs> claim your money. This is a strange sort of fiction, Mr. Poirot. But so long as you've finished your tea, I'll wash up. But I still worried about the scrap of label that they discovered here. Oh, certainly it said morphine. But there was one bit that did not quite fit, huh? The small M. Why not the capital? And eventually I realized that it was only part of the name of the drug that they discovered. <laughs> it was incomplete and not one for morphine at all. And I searched and searched. And at last, I discovered a drug of great interest. Apomorphine. An emetic. Yes, an emetic, Mr. Poirot. <coughs> Apomorphine makes you vomit. <coughs> Swallow poison and inject that and you vomit quite enough to expel the poison. And so it was the tea. You poisoned it. You drank it with Mary. <coughs> and a little while later, Elena Carlyle finds you with a prick from the needle in your arm, standing over that basin where you had been so sick. And now I have to do it again. The poison's safely washed up, though luckily I had much less than you. Not morphine this time. Something nastier. But nobody will quite know how it entered your system. And there's no trace of it. <coughs> oh, but my dear lady. That is. You see? I hate and always have hated. So, if you please, I think you will be needed. Monsieur Winter? is for you. It is from the lodge and it saved your life. You have been acquitted. You are free to go. 
but... Now, there is someone outside who will explain to you everything, amongst other things, who it was who wrote to you your letter. And it is to him that you should give the thanks. <laughs> Monsieur Poirot, you know what I told you. I... Mademoiselle Carlyle, one thing at death is no crime. Take you out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 